Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Let's go back to the comments. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon. Gary. Well, there could be some surprises ahead. Despite the massiveness of this majority, there are still some amendments in play which uh, Labour and uh, Tory rebels, the SNP and others, are hoping they can coalesce around to tweak things a bit next week. Uh, the most important of those is trying to get a, a, what, is, what is called a meaningful vote. So uh, a vote on the negotiations when they proceeded quite a distance but haven't absolutely been signed off so that they could effectively send the Prime Minister uh, back with a slightly different mandate in presumably very different economic circumstances. It's a long shot. A lot of these things are a long shot. The fundamental vote has gone the way it has and it is a massive majority. I've just been talking to Labour MPs who've been pinching their nose as they went through voting for Brexit, something they passionately don't believe in. One of them said, I'm going to have a bath after all this filthiness. And uh, on the other side, walking past them breezily, the sort of people they used to uh, put in entanglements in the Tory party, saying this is a wondrous moment. One of them compared it to the execution of Charles I. A bit bizarrely, perhaps. You get the idea. Gary Gibbon at Westminster. Christian. Well, I'm joined now from Chicago by the novelist Irvin Welsh and the writer and commentator Rachel Johnson is here in the studio. Rachel Johnson, how do you think British politics have risen to the challenge <laughs> uh, after the referendum? I think I mean... it's sunk to the challenge, hasn't it? <laughs> because these poor MPs have got this sort of Burkean uh, challenge, which is that, you know, who do they represent their consciences, the country, the party, their constituents. And what we've seen tonight is some of them have voted with their party, some of them voted with their constituents. I mean, I've just been in Westminster and I bumped into an MP who said, I'm going to vote against triggering Article 50 because my, my constituency in Liverpool was 75% remain. It's all over the shop. And uh, did we expect anything to be different after a knife-edge referendum like, like we had? Uh, Irvin Welsh, what, what have you made of it looking in you know, has, has Britain been able to respond to this massive challenge of the referendum result and the wave of populism that has gone with it? Uh, not really, and uh, it is a mess, and there's kind of no way out of it, but I think we are kind of reaping what we've sown for the last 35 years. I mean, it's for, for a lot of people in the kind of, you know, the media classes, like myself, this is a big kind of sort of horror and tragedy now, but for a lot of ordinary working people, the horror and tragedy has been kind of lasted for 30 years. And uh, this is a, the kind of manifestation of that. To, we have to kind of develop a politics that doesn't just transfer all the wealth of a nation, all the wealth of, a, of, a, of the globe to a very, very narrow elite. And uh, we've failed to do that and people are protesting and the, you know, our, our system are creaky battered old political system just can't cope with these kind of changes. I mean, the, the, the trouble is, uh, Rachel Johnson, that people have come to very different conclusions about what has caused this. You know, some people think it's about inequality and about mm. people being, you know, the majority of people being too poor. Others think it's about control and immigration and people being frozen out. There is no real sense of what's caused it. Well, I don't think there is one single cause. Um, but as somebody said tonight, you know, a vote that was really triggered by deep concern about immigration and the unfairness of the capitalist system, how populism, if capitalism doesn't work, we don't want socialism in this country, so we've got populism has risen up to take the, occupy the middle ground in a way that I think surprised everybody. But I think the real horror and tragedy is that the Brexit, Brexit will not deliver for the, the people who voted for it, the, the golden sunlit uplands. Um, the brave new world that everybody expects. I, I mean, for a start, we haven't had any negotiations yet, and as uh, Ivan Rogers said, the players aren't even on the pitch. Um, they voted, it was like, let's say you said, let's, we've got a house together, you want to sell the house, you want me to move into the house without having seen it. That is the situation this country is in. We haven't seen the house yet, and we're moving in. I mean, it, but it wasn't at the logical conclusion of the work of people like your brother, Boris Johnson, who wrote, you know, you know, wrote one thing one minute and then campaigned, you know, another way another minute. You know, our politicians a, didn't know okay, what defense, they really wanted. In his defence, he, uh, he, I think, cleaved to the whole notion of Brexit because he was passionately concerned about sovereignty. 
he believes in taking back control. And today is probably a great day for him as well. You know, as Jacob Rees-Mogg put it, it's a cross between Agincourt and Waterloo. Well, I don't think so. It's more like Dunkirk. Well, explain. <laughs> well, I just think we're going to have... Article 50 is now going to be triggered by an overwhelming majority. I think that's right. I think this is what the country voted for. But we still don't know what we're going to get when we leave the EU. And my argument is the country needs to have a second look. Parliament needs to have a second look at whatever the deal is, not just a vote, a veto. Uh, Irving Wells, how, how do you think this is changing us? Unfortunately, as well? we, can get, we can guess what we're going to get. Um, you know, within this new world order, we can guess what we're going to get. And Theresa May's visit uh, to America with Trump kind of gave it away to an extent. I mean, uh, we, we have uh, a, a system now whereby every nation is falling back in this very imperialistic, entitled nationalism, looking after their own interests. And if you think you're going to get a good trade deal with America with a, a zero-sum uh, negotiator like Trump, I mean, America first means America first. It doesn't mean America first and then a little bit for Britain. It's a winner-takes-all mentality, and this is this kind of um, this whole kind of uh, ethos is going to spread throughout the globe, and it's not going to be good for a depth of nation like Britain to be in that position. And are you fearful of what this wave of nationalism could mean on the streets, for example? Are we going to see? I mean, you know, a lot of people are genuinely afraid that we're going to see a new era of violence. You know, maybe not a world war, but of civil strife, racial violence, all of those kinds of divisions. Do you see that? Well, when you, when, when, you get kind of, when you get a nationalist, imperialist mentality, the next thing you get is trade wars, and the next thing you get is kind of conflict and war spreading after that. And you get the kind of, um, you get the, the wars of distraction to keep people on side with the whole nationalistic project. Uh, so I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a strong possibility that you're going to get more of this stuff emerging. Just very briefly, Rachel Johnson, I mean, do you fear that too? What I fear is, today is the day we've decided that Britain is going to leave Europe just at the time when I think Britain should be, get, Europe should be uniting against what is a very worrying situation across the Atlantic. Rachel Johnson, Irving Welsh, thank you both very much indeed. I've been